Hi there, I'm Daniel Seberg, and you're watching I.O. Live. We're here at Google I.O. And we're going to be showcasing content from different partners, from Googlers, of course, giving you tours of all the sandboxes here at Moscone Center over the next couple of days. And truth be told, we're actually here before the doors opened in Androidville. And we're going to start out by talking to Andrew from Criticism. So, Andrew, tell me, what is Criticism? I'm a little worried about some of these creatures coming <laughs> after me. Um, what does it mean to monitor apps and get that real-time information for a lot of developers? Sure, yeah, so we are a uh, cross-platform crash reporting and error analysis uh, tool for mobile app developers. In a broader sense, we, find, we help them find performance bottlenecks. Um, you know, the, the story is that there's a lot of great uh, testing companies here today, uh, but the fact is the mobile ecosystem, uh, especially Android, is moving so quickly that you know, really, uh, you need a diagnostic tool to help you once you release your application. And, and that's really where, what we provide. And uh, Yeah, let's go through a spin yeah, here so if we you can, can give us a demo. Jump right in here. So this is uh, when a developer integrates our SDK. It takes less than five minutes to get started. They see this page, and this is all their crashes that have occurred over time. So we're essentially a big data company. We're crunching all this data and helping uh, tell you what are the most critical problems affecting uh, you know, your user base. And this is an overarching look at what's going on, but you can even drill down to a particular user. Yeah, and so the data gets extremely granular. So these are all issues. You can drill down to a particular problem. Uh, we give the engineers a look in the stack trace. If there's a localization issue, they can quickly drill in uh, where on the map. Uh, we also provide some diagnostics. So the idea here is we help recreate what the average user looks like at the time where they had a problem. So if it was a memory leak, you'd see this skewed to the right. If they ran out of disk space, you'd quickly see that. If it was a device-specific problem or an OS-specific issue, uh, it would quickly become apparent here. And the idea is that we help you recreate the issue internally uh, and quickly push out a fix. And, and earlier you were showing me what looked like a heart rate monitor view of what's going on with different users. What's that all about? Yeah, so everything we do is in real time. So these are app loads and crashes as they come in. So often teams will have this up on a on a monitor as they release. And you know of course they hope that the uh, the error line right here is flatlining, but uh, you know issues just or, or critters you know do creep out <laughs> creep out in the wild. <laughs> uh, in addition to that we we help uh, you know, the manager of the team look at a high level on how they're doing over time. And so on each successive release, uh, we give you an idea if you're getting better at fixing those bugs. Great, so this is all sort of feedback that can be used and shared across the different teams. I mean, this is not just isolated to one person who can see this view. Anyone can get a quick snapshot of all this. Yeah, it's a very, it's a collaborative effort by your engineering team. So they can go in, they can comment on these issues, they can close bugs, uh, you know, they can drill Prioritize, down. Prioritize, right, based on the sheer volume of responses that you're getting. Yeah, you can imagine uh, needing to sort your, your crashes or your errors by the number of users affected. You know, you imagine uh, fixing the top 10 and that's easily 75% of your, your bugs gone right there. Uh, and it also ties into your workflow, so there's support integration where if you get an email from a user complaining, you can look them up in our system and figure out exactly what problems they were having. Uh, and of course, you know, integrations into your bug tracking systems and whatnot. Any quick advice for anyone who's developing on the Android platform and, <laughs> and how this could help them? Uh, well, we did we did some uh, early analysis that showed that I mean it's pretty common, but uh, null pointer exceptions and out of memory, you know, are the top uh, two issues that we typically see. And so, uh, you know, make sure you pay attention to your application lifecycle changes and stop allocating so many bitmaps. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good advice, Andrew from Criticism. Thank you so much and. Do you get? Do you pay these guys? Are they your employees? <laughs> yeah, they uh, they seem to follow us around everywhere. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks. Whew, man, I am winded. Androidville is a big place. I don't know if you noticed that. We're here with Pebble, and Eric to talk about uh, what Pebble is, but also, of course, about how uh, Android ties in and developers who are creating some cool stuff for this watch. So, talk us through what Pebble is, and we'll get to why running's tied into this as well. So, Pebble's a smartwatch that talks to your cell phone. Um, you can do things, normal watch things, like look at the time and, uh, that, and stopwatch and that kind of stuff. But the really cool thing about Pebble is that you can write apps for the watch and integrate Pebble with apps that run on your Android phone. Uh, so we're today launching an SDK um, that enables Android developers to push intents to our app that get forwarded to the watch. That's very cool. So it's a, it's a watch, it's a platform as well in a sense, and you've partnered with RunKeeper to talk about one here today uh, that a lot of people who are, who are jogging and, and runners would appreciate because you get that at a glance sort of a use with your watch rather than having to pull out your phone. 
Yeah, the idea is, uh, so, so RunKeeper is the first app that we've integrated with, and um, we were just chatting with their developer uh, this week. He was able to integrate um, RunKeeper with Pebble in about one hour. So what that meant was he added features that were unavailable to RunKeeper users before, uh, and using Pebble, um, yeah, it just makes his own his own app um, that much better. So one of the really cool things you can do is if you're going for a run, you know, you've got, normally uh, when you're going for a run with RunKeeper, um, you've got your uh, you've got your phone going, your GPS connected in your pocket. Um, but if you're say stop to you know you see a friend on the street or something like that, and you you chat for a moment, you you have to like press the pause button in the app. Um, or it auto detects it after a little while. But with Pebble, if you want to pause, you can just pause it, and then when you want to start your activity again, you can just click the button here, and activity resumed. And it starts your uh, starts your run again. The cool thing about Pebble um, and RunKeeper together is that uh, instead of having to look at your phone to see your stats, like your distance traveled, your lapse time, or your pace, you can just look down to your watch and see. All that, all that detail is sort of on your watch. It's kind of like a heads-up display for, for the app. And any advice you would give to developers who are really excited about doing something for Pebble, uh, you know, whether it's something related to sports or activities or just getting through life without having to pull out your phone all the time? I mean, what, what sort of things are you looking at coming down the pike? Well, I think at the beginning, uh, Pebble's going to be really useful for sports and fitness applications. Um, that heads-up display is going to be great. I could imagine, you know, going for a going for a day on the mountain, like skiing with Pebble, um, instead of having to take my phone out on the chairlift to see who's called or who sent me an email, I can just look down at my watch and see that. And then at the same time, see you know how fast I've been going. Um, other things that are great with Pebble are notifications. So um, what we really want to encourage people to do is use Pebble almost instead, or use Pebble as well as the notification bar. So if your app spits out notifications that pop up on the top uh, notification shade, you can also register an intent that will send that notification notification to the watch. So imagine if you're writing an IM client or a stock market app or a weather app or any sort of um, local check-in app. It would be great to be able to get those notifications right on your wrist. You know, the user can feel the vibration from the watch and instantly see what's going on without even pulling out their phone. Tell me a little bit about the history of Pebble for folks who don't know. Uh, you got your start, in a sense, on Kickstarter. Huge response. Coming out when? What sort of uh, interest have you seen since you uh, announced this? Yeah, so we've been working on watches for a little while now, but we launched Pebble, our latest watch, on Kickstarter a couple months ago. In about one month, we had uh, over... 85, we sold over 85,000 watches, um, and the watch, Pebble watches will start coming out in the fall, um, and users will start downloading apps for Pebble watches right around then. So um, we're opening our SDK out. Actually, today we're launching the Android SDK, um, and more portions of the SDK will come out over the summer. Um, people will be able to write their own watch faces uh, that actually run right on the watch, but today's the first time that we're talking about the intent-based API, which allows Android developers to push intents to the watch. Uh, any other sort of advice you would give to developers who are curious about doing something with this? Uh, we're going to have an emulator out in August, so not only could you start developing before the watch comes out, but you'll actually be able to see what your app will look like um, when you push things to the watch in August. Very cool. Are you wearing this all the time, pretty much now? 24-7, yeah. <laughs> It's cool. Great. Eric, thank you so much. And I'm, I've got Watch Envy at the moment. I feel like I've got to get a hold of one. How can people get one if they want one still? Uh, if you go to getpebble.com, you can uh, get in line for picking up a watch. And if you're a developer, you can go to uh, developer.getpebble.com to check it out. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. And i got to run off now. Okay. All right. We have flown over here to talk to Ryan from Hipmunk. Hipmunk being a travel app helps you find flights and hotels and uh, Ryan we're going to give, give folks a little demo of how it works but also of course talk about the experience with Android so maybe walk us through uh, the idea of the agony sure. uh, ranking with sure it. so we at Hitmon consider it uh, a really pain a uh, common pain point for a lot of people is travel planning especially on a phone because phones are a very unique form factor and getting a lot of information in a small space is really difficult so it's something we took pretty seriously um, one of the first things we worked on was flight search um, which we took a lot of time to make look good. Um, so basically, to, to do a search, you enter your, your city destination dates, all the standard stuff. Um, then once you've run a search, you'll get to a result set that looks like this. And this is probably different than anything you've seen before. Um, what we lay out are the flight in a bar that shows you how long it is, whether or not there's a layover, and who's flying it. And uh, in specific, we do a thing called uh, sorting by agony, which is to say that we don't strictly sort by price, because we consider your time worth something. 
So if you'll notice here, we have a nonstop Delta flight for 423, which is actually above a US Airways, which is in, less expensive, but uh, both longer and has a layover. So we're kind of saying, it's not that much more expensive for how much time you're saving, which in this case is, is over three hours. Which is, you know, that's a good point though. You could save a hundred bucks, but then you're, you have yeah. a layover for four hours and you end up hating yourself for agreeing to that. Exactly. Travel is agonizing. You just want to get to your destination in as good a mood as possible, right? So, uh, so that's what Agony is designed to help you with. But if you want to just see by price, we're not going to let you not do that. We show by price. You can see the least expensive first. Um, and then, uh, you know, once you've selected your flights, you can just go ahead and, and book through the app. And it will actually tie in your calendar, too, if, you've, if there are particular dates that you need to remember when you're booking a flight. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So one of the things we added very recently was what we, what we kind of call calendar integration. So often when you're planning a trip, you'll have things on your calendar you're traveling for or events that you need to kind of avoid when you're picking a flight, maybe an appointment or something. And so what we'll do is actually show those things on the calendar, on the, or that are on your calendar on the timeline here. So you can know, well, maybe that morning flight isn't a great idea because I kind of need to be somewhere until 10 or something like that. That's right. All right. So you've helped us with our flights. Now we need to figure out the hotel accommodations. Yeah. How does that work? Uh, well, that, you just go over to a hotel search. And the first thing we do is let you pick your location or just do my location, which is pretty much always the case. You're just looking for a hotel nearby. So if we just do one for tonight for one guest, we just hit search. And uh, as the hotels load in here, they start to place themselves on the map. And using Google Maps, of course. Yep, using Google Maps, of course. And uh, we actually had a lot of fun working with this on Android in specific. Um, the Google Maps uh, SDK really allowed us to do a lot of the map stuff without really even having to worry about it. Just kind of took care of it for us. So it was nice to have, uh, have Google helping us out with something that really is technically challenging. Okay, so it looks like a bunch of them had loaded in here. Yep, yep. Flip, uh, search just finished. So on the map, you'll see the... the gray pips and then colored pips. So what we've done there is we've shown where all the hotels are and attempted to suggest some of the ones that would be the best value for you. Um, and those are the colored pips. So if you if you pick on one of them, you can see what the hotel's called, a little picture of it, price, rating, um, and uh, you, know, you can pop around, see if one's more interesting. Now along with that calendar integration, if you have an event that you're coming to, uh, you know, to, for example, San Francisco for, we'll put a little pip on the map that shows where that event is so that you can know what hotels are nearby. Um, and then another thing we do, which is pretty cool, is if you haven't maybe been to a city before, we do have what are called heat maps, which hopefully the Wi-Fi will load in here pretty quick. Uh, but often you don't really know where you want to be in a city, but what the heat maps do is show you, well, here's where all the food is. Maybe you're a foodie, you want to know where the best restaurants are. This will help you with that suggestion. You know, the, the warmer it is, the more likely some good food is going to be nearby. Um, little things like that help make the hotel search a lot easier on a phone where you don't really have room to go and open a bunch of tabs and learn about the city. You just need to know where to stay real quickly and get it done. Yeah, make it efficient. All right, just um, quickly, any sort of learnings you can pass on to other Android developers and, yeah. and something you maybe take away from the experience? Yeah, sure. So I've worked on Android a couple of years, and the biggest thing I've learned is often when I face a problem, I want to solve it with the tools I already know, but there's truly often a way that Android is trying to get you to use that they've built into the system and made really robust. So don't be afraid to take a second and learn what Android is suggesting you use because it'll pay for itself in the long run. It'll work with newer systems, it'll look better as they update the, uh, the OS itself. Um, and instead of you kind of aging like without the system, you get to kind of keep up for free. Uh, and people will feel more natural using your app because you're using things that they're used to. And less stressed, which, which is what Hipmunk is all about, less stress travel. Yeah, all right, Ryan, travel, safe travels as you're on the go. Thanks we appreciate it. Yeah, definitely, it's been fun. Photo sharing, social, and Wi-Fi Direct. These are all things that are part of Ikata Systems, and I'm joined now by Alan to talk about what, uh, what that all means, mm -hmm. and with Android, of course, in particular. And your shirt says Tapestry. Tell yes. me what that's all about. Yes, uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, uh, so Ikata Systems, uh, we aim to make the mobile social experience more personal and more engaging by, um, by uh, facilitating um, interactions in the physical world. So our, um, our first application, the first incarnation of our vision is an app called Tapestry, which is essentially a, a, um, a proximity-based uh, photo show and tell application. It allows you to share photos with people who are close to you, with the word close being a double entendre. Close me being people that you care about, your friends and family, and close uh, from a proximity distance standpoint. So you can choose who those people are within your Absolutely. network. You get to curate your photos and curate the people that you want to share those photos with. All right, can you run us through a little demo here? Sure. So um, the, uh, the demo is actually occurring, running on ICS, but the product will only launch on Jelly Bean. So uh, the, you'll see some minor differences and tweaks, but we'll go ahead and run through these right now. So 
So these are as though we're sharing with these different devices here. Exactly. Set it up as though I, but I could be anywhere within how much space right within now? Within 20 to 30 meters. But the idea of the, the sharing, again, is, is the experience we're after is people huddling, huddling around. For example, let's say um, everybody goes to a concert. Everybody perceives the night from their own perspective, from their own vision, from their own lens. And at the end of the day, we're all at 3 a.m. At the, at the coffee shop, and uh, we're going through pictures, and uh, this is the experience we're trying to, um, to, uh, right, to so create. So instead of all huddling around one phone, like, hey, look at this. That's right. Now everyone has their own devices. Like, absolutely, yeah. with some interesting twists to, to okay. that experience. All right. So uh, let's say here, we'll um, pick a couple photos. Speaking of concerts, let's say we uh, all went to a concert. So and you're, you're choosing the photos there right now. Exactly, you're picking the photos, and you hit a button. That's a curate button. And uh, in this version, um, it is asking you to turn on Wi-Fi Direct, but in Jelly Bean, um, it'll go straight to the app. So another reason to, uh, to upgrade to Jelly Bean. So as soon as that's turned on, so right now, this phone is broadcasting um, within a 20, 30 meter radius that you're showing a slideshow. Now these other folks here, you might not be able to see on the screen, these folks will... Um, they're receiving this slideshow in a sense, yes. they're experiencing it. You're yes. driving the, the, the vehicle or the slideshow in a Absolutely. sense, and they're participating. So they're, they're discovering your slideshow, and as soon as they find you, they'll click on you, and you should get a request saying someone's trying to join your slideshow. You accept that. The other members join as well. Uh, let's see if this goes through. Oh, here it is. I'm sorry. Okay, so we can see that it started off here on That's this right, device. Exactly. Let's see if that goes through. There it is. So you yep, see okay. all screens um, have, have the photo, and as you scroll through, Everybody's image moves in synchronicity. Uh, if there's a photo that you like that you don't have on your device, you simply swipe down. Maybe we just switch the, um, see if you can see the, on the other side here. So you can actually share the photos as well as show them to people. Absolutely. So if this comes up, we'll see it does. So if you see, this is being, what's, what you see on the screen here is, is a client. When you swipe down, You'll see the image is saved directly peer to peer from device to device. Not a single bit goes over the 2G, 3G, 4G, Wi Fi, Bluetooth, whatever it is. It goes directly peer to peer from one device to another. And if, um, and, you know, the, going back to the idea of, of the experience, if you pinch the zoom, all the devices. Um, they all get the same experience. Exactly right, exactly right. Any, this is really cool stuff. I mean, any sort of learnings from this? Any takeaways for folks who are developing on Android that you want to Absolutely. share? Absolutely. Um, especially for us, um, Wi-Fi Direct is, is available for the very first time and only uh, in Android. So uh, I think it really speaks to the vision uh, of Android who realize that technology as it evolves should not just be more powerful, but also more personal. And I think with a proximity-based sensor using Wi-Fi, I think it facilitates a new type of interaction between people. And how can folks get a hold of this uh, if they want to try it out? Yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll be going live tomorrow. Okay, yeah. well, Alan, this is really cool stuff. Thank you so much. From Ikata Systems, yeah. Tapestry, be on the lookout for it. Thank you, Dan. All right, appreciate, appreciate it. it. Okay, if you've ever had the experience of having, let's say, 20 or 30 tabs open in your browser or trying to remember to read something or view something later, well, Pocket is to the rescue. Nate is with Pocket, the founder of Pocket. It used to be called Read It Later. So, Tell me about it, and was that description accurate? Uh, absolutely, yeah. As you, as you said, uh, you know, the problem is that we're kind of we're running into great content all day long, and uh, the issue ends up being that you know, as you said, like you're emailing yourself links, or you have a billion tabs open in your browser, but ultimately the time that you discover that content is not necessarily the time that you want to view it, or even really the the best the best place or the best device to view it on. Um, and that's why there's Pocket. So Pocket's helping us with that information overload, in a sense, to right. kind of organize it and save it for later. Exactly. So instead of trying to remember where you found that article or that video or anything else you kind of run across online, you can simply just put it in Pocket, and it'll be in one place accessible from anywhere. All right. Well, let's have a look at this sort of digital Pocket that yeah. we can put it into, in a sense. Now, you've got a laptop here. We've got a couple of uh, Android devices. Tell me about how uh, a website can get saved into Pocket. Sure. So if, if, for example, if I'm on my computer and I'm coming across some article that looks interesting to me, uh, I can simply just save that to Pocket. And in this case, I'm using our Chrome extension. It's just a one-click uh, save to Pocket. You can save articles. You can save uh, video. You can save anything. So for example, I'm also here, I can save uh, a YouTube video. 
And uh, you know, so whenever I'm actually ready to view that content, so for example, if I'm on my commute on the way into work, um, and I, I can just simply pick up my phone, and all of that content that I just saved is here. So and does it save it chronologically? Is that how it comes into your uh, device? Yeah, you can you can order it different ways, but um, generally, you know, it's it's kind of newest is at the top and uh, flows through. So for example, that this article that I just saved here. Um, is, is now on the, on the device, and we format it in this really great, easy to, to review uh, article layout, um, as you can see. And it just synced right to the phone without really me having to do anything. So that's a good point. So, you know, you used to be called read it later, but you might want to view something later, shop somewhere later. There right. are lots of iterations of what you want exactly. to do later. So we can even, you know, you can uh, very easily switch between different content modes. So, for example, if I want to just say, I just want to see my videos, I can just switch, and now all the videos and, and that YouTube video that I just saved is, is easy. To find as well. Now we've got an Android tablet, same sort of an experience. What was it like developing for yeah. to get all of this content across different devices and that experience of consuming it differently? Right. So Android's made that really easy for us for a number of reasons. So for example, the articles and stuff I saved, they've already synced to my tablet as well. Um, you know, if I have other devices or other platforms, that's all kind of in sync immediately. Um, but Android, you know, between a phone, which is a small form factor, and a big tablet form factor, they've made things very easy to, to move between those different sizes. Uh, the flexible layouts and everything have been really great. Um, I would say the, the best thing that we have um, on Android is actually, as I was just describing, the fact that all this stuff happened instantly. Um, that's something we can only do on Android, even though we're on other platforms as well, is using C2DM, the cloud to device messaging system. So essentially, the second I hit uh, save to pocket on the computer, it, it messaged out to all the, to the devices to get that content, download it, and have it ready to go so that when you're on the subway, even if you don't have uh, Wi-Fi, you can actually view it. Oh, that's great. So just finally, you want to show us what it looks like yeah, on the sure. tablet here? So uh, uh, very similar layout, but I mean, optimized certainly for a tablet. Um, and again, I, I think what I use uh, tablets most for is, is viewing videos. So I'd love to be able to just kind of open up the video section and just kind of find something to watch. Um, and uh, just kind of kick back on the couch and watch videos, which is great for a tablet. Um, any advice or, or learnings that you had with the Android development experience you want to share with folks? Yeah, so for us, it's been, you know, we certainly have a, an interesting perspective because we are on so many other platforms in addition to Android. And let's say our, our largest, uh, our biggest kind of advice is always, if you're going to build an Android app, build an Android app. You know, if you see, if you look at our apps on other platforms, we all really respect the conventions of each of those platforms. And, and if you look at, you know, so what Android, or I'm sorry, what uh, Pocket looks like on Android versus on our, our website or versus on our iOS devices, uh, you know, we've made it look like an Android app and work really well as an Android experience. Cool. Well, Nate, thank you so much yeah. for that demo from Pocket. And speaking of later, stay tuned for much more later here on IO Live. I'm Daniel Seberg. Stay tuned.